Good morning, Cross and Crown. Uh, thanks for joining us for worship. Our text for today is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 21. We are continuing in our series of just moving through the book of 1 Peter together. This is the word of the living God. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure it, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to, to open your word together, to hear, to hear from the word of God. Um, I ask that uh, we would be edified by your truth, that we would have hearts that, that are soft, that are open to, to hearing your scriptures, to obeying your scriptures, that we would also be encouraged knowing that you are, you are with us in this. Thank you for, again, the opportunity to to gather, to hear from your word. And I pray that, um, th that this word would bless our people. All this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I read verses 9 through 21 to give us kind of the full context of what we're going to be discussing. Pastor Matthias talked about verses 9 and 10 last week, and 11 through 21 is really what we're going to focus on this week. Now, as we were reading through that passage, there may have been a couple topics that kind of piqued your interest of we're going to spend some time talking about governing authorities and how as Christians we interact with governing authorities. Considering the past couple years and everything that's been going on, that's quite an interesting topic to dive into. I remember even seeing the, the sermon schedule. We have like an Excel spreadsheet that says who's preaching what. And when we got into 1 Peter, I was like, oh, who's going who's gonna to preach the, the government passage? I was like, Matthias is going to do a great job on that. And I went down the road and it's like, well, that'll be me. That, that'll be great. So I'm excited to be able to do this. Um, and even thinking about this topic and just kind of the difficulty of it over the past couple of years, I even looked at chapter three where it talks about uh, wives and relationships to husbands and how that can be a passage we focus a lot on. I was like, man, that one might even be easier given the context of, of what we're in. So saying all that, what I, here's what I want to do this morning. I want the Word of God to guide our conversation. I want everything that we are believing and trying to understand being rooted in the Word of God. Um, I want Isaiah 66 verse 2 to, to really set the tone as we approach this text together. Isaiah 66 2 says, But this is the one to whom I look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. So I want to be people that that tremble at his word and are ready to hear a word from the Lord this morning. So let's go ahead and get to work. So now we're going to be entering again verses 11 through 21. And really the, the main point or the, the theme that's going to guide us through everything and we're going to keep coming back to is what does submission and honorable living look like for Christian exiles? What does it look like to be the chosen people of God? As I mentioned last week, Pastor Matthias really talked about in verse 9 and 10 that we are this chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And, and he referenced the terms indicative and imperative. And indicative essentially means something that is true, something that God has done. It is, it, it is what he has accomplished. That's the indicative. And then the imperative, in light of that truth, 
This is how we obey. So Matthias focused on the indicative, and we're really today, the imperative is, again, how do we live as the people of God, as this royal priesthood? How would God have us live? So let's go ahead and dive into the text. I'm going to begin in verse 11 for it. It says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners in exile. So right off the bat, I want to touch on the word beloved. This, this call from the Apostle Peter is not this top-down, dogmatic, I'm the Apostle Peter, you need to obey. But beloved is this, you are loved, I care for you. It, it is the plea <clears throat> from an elder or a pastor, someone that cares for them. So beloved, I urge you as sojourners or exiles, and he's continuing to hit that theme of, this is not our home. As Christians, even as the chosen people of God, we are not in our final home yet. We are exiles. We are not, this is, this is not our home. And then the imperative, the, the command for us is to abstain from the passions of our flesh. And abstain just means to, to, to keep away, to avoid. It has a connotation of being continual. This isn't just a one-time event, but he's saying, live your life in this manner. And then he uses kind of an odd phrase. He says, the, the passions of the flesh. Well, if you're new to church, that might kind of sound like an odd concept. What does he mean? Is it like actually our flesh? What is, what, is, what is Peter trying to get us to understand here? Well, this is where we want to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul actually gives us a very long list of things that would characterize the flesh. And so this is from Galatians 5, 19 through 20. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So the, you know, the 20 things he lists, if that's not enough, he says, and things like these. So these are things that these passions, they well up in us, and they are not characteristic of the people of God. This is our life prior. Compare them to fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience. So the Apostle Peter is saying we are supposed to not live into those passions, those, those passions of the flesh. And he, he finishes the verse by saying, which wage war against your soul. So there is this conflict, even though we've been saved, there's this conflict with the, with the prior flesh, with these things that continue to, to dwell in us. And I think, again, the Apostle Paul in, in Romans gives us a, a very clear example of what this should look like in our lives. He says in, in Romans 8, 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So very plainly, Peter is making the point that in our, in our personal lives, in our personal conduct, to be the chosen people of God is to, to be at war with the sin in our life. And that's just like the, kind of the first question for us, application point for us is, is there a war within us? Is there a war within my spirit and my heart that I don't want to give in to the flesh, but to live in the truth of what God has done for me, am I fighting that sin? Am I pursuing the things that he would have for me? Moving on to verse 12, Peter shifts a little bit. He says, keep your conduct then among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds. So now he's shifting from, okay, your, your personal holiness and how you, that you feel that turmoil in you as a Christian. But then he seems to be concerned with how others view our conduct. And I, I asked the question, why? Why is Peter bringing this up? Was there something in the historical context that would have want, made him focus on this? And there were. Given that time in the Roman Empire, Christians were being accused of a few different things that, that weren't true. And they were giving them a, a bad reputation. These weren't bad things, but Peter's making the point that don't give them any real reason that they could speak against you. A couple of the things that they were being accused of. Uh, Christians were having these secret gatherings. They were having church services. They were having worship services in people's homes, and they were gathering, and, but they were seen as secret, and people didn't like that. They were accused of cannibalism, and that may seem kind of odd. Like, why is that? Well, we take the Lord's Supper every single Sunday, and we, we eat the body of our Savior. We drink the blood, metaphorically, symbolically. But if you're an outsider hearing that, 
that sounds crazy. So Christians were being accused of these things. And even they were being accused of defying the emperor. So in that time, to give allegiance to Caesar, it was very much a, a political statement. So for those Christians to saying that no, that Jesus is Lord, it's a political statement. So his, his, his focus for us is to say, those things are all good. <laughs> Gathering is the body of Christ. To take the Lord's Supper, to say that Jesus is Lord, all good. But then he's saying, keep your conduct, which is just the manner in which you live, the manner in which you behave. Keep it uh, honorable. Keep it honorable, honorable among the Gentiles so that they actually don't have an objective reason to say that what you're doing is wrong. They're going to speak against you as evildoers, but... Back up in verse 11, if you actually are waging war against the flesh in you, you're living a holy life, one that is pleasing at these accusations, they, they, they won't hold any weight. And then he seems at the end of the verse to say, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And I think that the point is a Christian's honorable life in the face of false accusation actually may result in an unbeliever's salvation, in, in, a, in a glorifying of God. The reason I feel that Peter's trying to make that point is he explicitly says that in chapter 3, verse 1. Let me read that for us. It says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Here's that word conduct again. So I think Peter's just trying to make the point that, hey, to be, to be the chosen people of God, holy living is... And then we live in a way that those outside the church, that's what it means by also by the word Gentiles there, is that, that they would have no basis to actually speak against Christians. All right, let's move on to verses 13 through 17. Peter's now moving from kind of the personal side of what it looks to be the chosen people of God to, to have honorable living as Christian exiles to the public sphere, to, to, to the civil realm in verses 13 in 17. Now, this is this next section is really 13 through 20. And but before I get there, I want to focus on verse 21 first. Let me read 21 again for us. It says, For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. So Peter, these these commands that are going to be coming up, Peter ends them by saying, Do these because you're walking in a way that Jesus Christ did, that your Savior did, and you are supposed to emulate him. You are supposed to walk like he did. It was one of the reasons that Christ came is so that we would be, as the scriptures would say, conformed to his image. Now, I very much want to clarify something here. I said that Christ, one of the reasons he came was so that we could walk like him. That is not the primary reason that Christ came. Christ came to save his people from their sins. Jesus Christ's primary mission was to lay down his life for those he would save. He lived a perfectly righteous life, obeying all the laws, the Ten Commandments perfectly, perfect submission to the Father's will. So he, in, he had this perfect righteous life. And then he suffered and died for, for us. Our, our sins were placed on him so that by faith in Jesus Christ alone, we're united to him. We get the righteousness that he achieved, and then we get forgiveness for the punishment that he bore. That's the gospel. Go back to the indicative imperative side of things. The indicative, what is true, is that Christ came to save sinners. That was his mission. That's what he was doing. The imperative, though, is if you are in Christ, if you believe in him, Walk like he did. So I just want to make that point that we don't get confused with what Peter is doing here is saying that's not what we're, we're not trying to walk like Christ to be accepted by him. We've been accepted and now we get to walk in his footsteps. So let's let that guide how we view the next verses. It, it, as we enter into verses 13 through 20, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, if you're not submitted to him, why would you obey any of these commands? They are going to be foolish to you because they are not the way of the world and they're not the way that the world thinks. Only if you are part of the kingdom of God and submitted to that king will these commands make sense. Now, verses 13 through 17, it's about submission to governing authorities. Now, 
I'm an accountant, so it helps me to think through categories of things and I've got spreadsheets in my head. And so as I'm looking at these verses, what helps me instead of just walking through them is saying, what is, what are these, what's this passage teaching on submission? How can I categorize them? So I've looked at six elements of Christian submission to governing authorities. And we're going to look at six elements that's derived from the biblical text. They are the command for submission, the motive, the extent, the reason, the attitude, and then the application. That might feel like a lot. We have sermon notes that are on the app that you can see all of these outlined. All right, let's start with the first one. The first one is the command for submission, and it is be subject. Be subject to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or governors. And subject essentially means submit. It means bring under control. It means to obey. Clearly, we are called to have a, a posture of submission. I've heard uh, funny stories of, you know, sometimes on controversial texts, someone will come up to the pastor after the sermon and say, all right, I, I know you said it says be subject, but what, what's it mean in the Greek? Like, what's the, what's the original Greek mean? It means to submit, exactly what our translation says. We can trust the translation that we have. And so we are, we are called to have a posture of submission and subjection to, it says human institutions, which is kind of an interesting phrase. Essentially, it means created by humans. So then we can go, wait a minute, is this, is this from God? Is this, is this, are we supposed to submit to this? Well, Romans chapter 13, 13 actually makes this very clear. It says, uh, 13, 1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. So we know that these governing authorities are ultimately instituted by God. So the command is to submit. The motive, why do it? That, that, that's what I'm getting at at the motive. Why, why do it? And it goes back to verse 21 of what we were just talking about. We, we submit because we love the Lord Jesus. We obey primarily because we desire to honor the Lord Jesus and walk in his footsteps. I'm even reminded back in chapter 2, verse 5, it says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So the why, the primary reason of why we do it is to obey the Lord Jesus and to walk in a manner like he did, the way that he lived his life in submission to the Father, in submission to the authorities in his life. It's also a, a desire to show that this life is not where, where our hope is. We don't root everything in this life and trying to get everything out of this life, but we know that there is, is a hope to come. We have a living hope that goes beyond this life. Number three, the extent. By the extent, I mean how far does this authority go? Okay, so we're supposed to submit to governing authorities. Do we submit to them in absolutely everything? I mean, it is interesting from the text that it's not just one person that Peter seems to be making the point to. It's not, hey, just to the emperor, but it's, it's the emperor. It's the governing, the governors that he sends. So he's making the point that if, if that person rightfully has authority over you from a governing perspective, you submit. Now, are they given a task? Again, is there... Is their authority ultimate or is it, are there parameters? Well, verse 14 says this, or to governors is sent by him to do two things, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So there are, there are two primary things from this text that governing authorities do. They punish evil and reward good. So we know it's, it's a limited authority. It's not limited. They have a sphere of authority. Now, one concept that I want to touch on is called sphere sovereignty. It's kind of a big vocab word. That's what you can tell people that you learned at church day. Sphere sovereignty essentially means that someone may have, or an institution may have authority, but, but there is a place for it. It's not, it doesn't extend everywhere. Let me give an example. Prior to my time in ministry just a few years ago, I worked in the accounting realm. I actually worked at the online real estate company Zillow. And my boss there had authority over me. 
She could tell me what work papers I needed to do, my deadlines, when I needed to be there, the expectations of my job, proper authority. Now, if she had said, Emerson, here's your to-do list. Also, I need you to pick up my dry cleaning. Well, I think we would all kind of go, wait a minute. You, you have authority, but you don't have that authority. So it's an example of a good authority in its proper realm, but then when it oversteps or goes outside of that, there's, there's a question of, no, you, you don't have that authority. So that's fear sovereignty. And later when we talk about the concept of civil disobedience, we will talk more about that. And I, and I know in, all, in the back of a lot of our minds, especially given the context of what's going on, it's okay, they have authority, but, but what about this? And what about that? And we will get there. We will talk about civil disobedience in a few minutes. Number four, the reason. The reason for submission is the question of why is this happening? Not why, why am I going to submit, but why is this happening? Verse 15 tells us, for this is the will of God. It's so funny. I think often we, we talk about wanting verses that say, like, what's the will of God for my life? I, I have a verse. I have a verse. And it says, this is the will of God that you would submit to these governing authorities. I mean, it, that kind of goes against normally the kind of the Hobby Lobby pictures you'd put up on your, your wall for like, this is the will of God. It's not quite as uh, exciting to say it's the will of God to submit to governing authorities, but it's biblical. It's what God has for us. And then it, that verse goes on to say, this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So by, by doing this, we are silencing those that have, a, have a, a willful rejection of Christianity, a willful rejection of the truth. And by doing, by living in this way, by submitting in this way, it is an apologetic of our faith. Apologetic means a, a defense. It is a, a reason that we do it. We're demonstrating one that we're not anarchists, that, 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 that authority is set up by God. Authority is good. It is something from the Lord. We want to demonstrate that. And then kind of going back to his point up in verse 12, where he's saying when they speak against you as evildoers, I think he's making the point that is good behavior of Christians will minimize slanderous attacks on believers, revealing that charges of moral fault have no basis. Opponents will be discovered to be animated by hatred, lacking any objective ground for their criticism of believers. So it's the Lord's will that we would live in this way to glorify him and to show people that whatever they may say against us, it's actually not true. We're, we're living for that other hope. We're, we're going back to that theme of we're living as a chosen people as exiles. And what does submission and honorable living look like as the true people of God? Number five, the attitude of submission. And this really flows from verse 16. Live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. So we are free in Christ. We are no longer slaves to our own sin, and we're actually not slaves to any authority other than King Jesus. So our attitude is one of submission. We willingly submit. We don't do this unwillingly, but because our allegiance is to someone higher, to a higher law. True freedom comes in being a servant or a slave to Christ. That word there, they've, they've uh, translated it servant, and in different places in the New Testament, it's also translated slave. It's interesting, our culture is constantly in the pursuit and in advertising true freedom and our pursuit of pleasure, purpose, even redefinition of who God is and what he wants for your life. But the Bible says that that's actually slavery to your own passions, your own desires. Even think back up to verse 11 where Peter is saying, don't give in to those fleshly passions. Your, your old self wants that. The culture is pointing us to that. True freedom is in submission to Jesus. And as slaves of Christ, as servants of Christ, we have the freedom to obey, 
we also in some instances have the freedom to disobey. So this is not a blind capitulation to all authority. It's not, I willingly submit to whatever. It is a, a Holy Spirit-fueled conviction of proper obedience to Jesus, that I will use the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to help me know proper obedience and disobedience, ultimately in submission to King Jesus. All right, the last one. This is the application of submission. And this I'm really going to focus on verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So this seems to be giving us a, a hierarchy of, of affection, a hierarchy of, of devotion, and help us to know where and how should our affections be shown to the people around us. So is everyone on the same level? No. It seems to see that, the, the, that everyone is different than brotherhood and different from God. And then emperor is, is again, similar to everyone. And so honor, let's, let's, just go through, let's just go through each of them. It says honor everyone. And honor means respect. So because everyone was created uh, with inherent value and dignity and worth by God, everyone is due respect. And then it says, love the brotherhood, which in this context would have been encompassing of the body of Christ. Brotherhood was a familial language that would have included brothers and sisters in the Lord. And it says, love the brotherhood. Which is, I think is interesting given, given our context where we are so concerned with the unbeliever, with the, per, the honor of the everyone. We, we want to do that. But our brothers and sisters in Christ actually come before those who are outside the church. Just to show you that this is actually a, a consistent teaching throughout Scripture. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 says this, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are the household of faith. So this is a teaching within the New Testament to say, Honor everyone. Love your brothers and sisters in Christ. And, finally, and, then, and then the next one is fear the Lord. And Pastor Matthias preached on this a couple weeks ago. A holy reverence, the highest adoration and fear comes to the Lord, is for the Lord. Now as Christians, we know we don't fear of judgment, but he is God Almighty and deserves our holy reverence. Finally, honor the emperor. And just to provide some context here, um, Peter was writing this letter most likely when Nero was in charge of the Roman Empire. So that's probably the emperor that he has in mind. Nero was wicked, persecuted Christians in horrific ways. Uh, he was not for Christians. This is not a light command, a, a light imperative, if you will, from, from Peter to say, honor the emperor. And I think for us this is a... I want to ask how we are doing in honoring our emperors. How am I doing in this? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 talk about praying for our leaders. Are we for them? And let me put some names on it just so that we put our cards on the table. Are we for, were we for President Trump? Are we for President Biden? Governor Inslee, or whatever governor is in your jurisdiction. And by four, I don't mean agree with everything, but care about them, pray for them, desire their salvation, desire that their, that their laws would be in accordance with the law of God. But what's the posture of our heart as we think about them, talk about them? Again, that doesn't mean that we're not truthful and honest, but honor means respect. And so I think this is, this is a massive application point for all of us, given our context of how are we doing here? How are we doing of honoring the rulers in our life? Definitely something to, for us all, and I know myself, to think about. All right, so there, as we've got, moved through those six points, are there times that we don't obey the governing authorities? The answer is yes. This topic is called civil disobedience. Um, and essentially, here, here's a definition. It is the refusal to obey certain laws, demands, or commands of a government for the sake of a higher law, for the allegiance to something higher. 
Are there any examples in scripture? Is this something that we're just finding useful so that we can bring in and try and navigate difficult governing relationships? There's actually many examples in scripture. These are in your notes, but let me just highlight them quickly. Uh, Back in Exodus chapter one, you have the Hebrew midwives who were commanded to kill all the baby boys. They, They disobeyed. Daniel chapter six, Daniel's not supposed to pray to the Lord. He continues to pray. Uh, John the Baptist and Herod in Mark chapter 6, where John um, went to Herod and said, I don't think it's lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Not a super popular comment, which actually cost him his life eventually. In the book of Acts, in many instances, but I have one example in Acts 5, where Peter preaching the gospel and the Pharisees, the governing authority saying, like, stop, you need to stop doing that. And Peter's response is, no, I won't. I won't stop. And then one in Acts 22 where Paul actually rebukes the Romans who are arresting him for he, he's, they're violating their, the law of the land. He's holding them accountable and saying, you're not in accordance with the law of the land. So it's interesting. He's not even directly appealing to a, a specific command of God, but he's saying the, the institution, the governing authority that, that is set up by God, you're not obeying. So those are a few examples. And I think we can kind of summarize and say civil disobedience occurs when the government's laws or commands are in violation of God's laws and commands. Another way is saying the government's commands, they command something contrary to love for neighbor, they're compelling evil, or they're violating an individual's conscience, which is being informed by the scriptures. Now, I definitely, I want to address kind of the elephant in the room as we're thinking through the government um, over the past couple of years and mandates and restrictions specifically related to COVID, it, the COVID pandemic, it would feel odd not to say anything about it. And so what I want to do is I want to walk through one example of here at Cross and Crown, how we, how we have evaluated this, and then I want to have some, uh, some discussion on kind of the interaction between us as brothers and sisters in Christ. So have we enacted civil disobedience across and crown? Yes, on one instance we have. Uh, in 2021, there was a mandate that you could gather, but then corporate singing was not allowed for fear of transmission of the virus. And as the elders, we came together and said, the scripture is so clear on this. There's over a hundred verses that command us to sing to the Lord, to sing to each other, I mean, just one of those is Colossians 3.16, that we could not comply. That for the sake of the higher law, for the sake of being obedient to Jesus and the scriptures, we did not comply with that. So again, that's, that's one example and one kind of behind the scenes of how we thought through it. My invitation to you is if there was any other decision we communicated or how we thought through something, please come talk to us. Please come... You may even at the end of the day disagree and say, I would have done something different, but you can understand the thought process of how we reached that decision. What I'm more concerned about, as opposed to just crossing crown kind of in total as the entity, as, as the church, it's, it's the personal decisions we've all had to make in this area. And I think what's come up in my conversations with people is what happens if we disagree, or even more importantly, how could we disagree on this? How how could this person think this or think that this is the proper submission or not submission to these governing authorities? And I just want to highlight again in my conversations and trying to filter it through scripture, where does the disagreement come from? A few different things. One, people are disagreeing on the interpretation or boundaries of sphere sovereignty. Where does the government's authority lie? Where does the churches lie? Where does my... And if you have that bubble slightly different than someone else, sometimes you're going to come to a different conclusion. There could be some disagreement on the exact interpretation of the two tasks of government, which are to reward good and punish evil. What is good for neighbor? And in many of my conversations with people, there is disagreement on What is good? What is loving? Given all the information that I know and my personal convictions on things, I'm coming to a different conclusion on what is good and loving for my neighbor. 
And then the last thing I would say is our consciences before the Lord are different. They're, they're pricked by different things. We even have an example from Scripture that highlight this fact. In 1 Corinthians 10, 22 for 33, Paul gives the example of meat sacrificed to idols. Now, I really wish he had done something on masks and vaccines, but I don't think that was specifically relevant to him at that point. But the principle of what he had talked about is. So he talks about two believers going to a, a dinner gathering of an unbeliever that it is presenting meat for the meal for, that had been sacrificed to idols. And Paul says, it's fine for you to eat, but if your belie believing friend has, uh, that violates their conscience, then out of solidarity with them and love for the brotherhood, you don't, eat, you don't eat the meat, even though you know it's fine. And this could even offend the unbelieving host. You, you, you care more about the brother or sister that's, that's with you as opposed to the... Um, and so all that's highlighting is two believers, two people trying to love Jesus are coming to different conclusions on what they should do with this meat sacrifice to idols. My point is this. We will disagree. We, ha we have disagreed, and we're going to continue to disagree. And the way forward is to more understand each other in that disagreement. And, and above all, we love each other in the midst of that. That as long as the motive and the reason, all those kind of elements of Christian submission are in place and that person is honestly trying to obey the Lord Jesus, then we need to have a posture of love and understanding as opposed to wanting to, to distance from each other. This has been hard. It's been really, really hard. Um, but I don't even think providing the right answer on any of those individual questions of what about it's God would have us be unified and show love in the midst of disagreement. I think that's what God has for us as we try to honor everyone and then love the brother and sisterhood. Now that we have those easy verses out of the way, let's move to the final section, which is verses 18 through 20. And again, Keep the main theme in mind. Peter continues to highlight different instances where he's saying to be the royal priesthood, to be the chosen race, live like this. So let me look at verses 18 through 20. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So the word servant here, I mentioned earlier, but many times is translated slave. And so it's using the word servant because it's really, it's like a household slave. Now, immediately we import everything from our most recent experience of slavery into that, um, it, which it's hard for us not to do that. But we have to understand that what was going on there in the Roman Empire and where Peter w was writing, different, still not good though. The concept of, of a household slave still would have been the not ideal uh, a situation it was very common, though, in Rome, about one out of every five people would have been in this servant, household, master relationship. But what I want us to focus on is this is not the race-based slavery that we had in the United States in our history. It is different. Now, for the sake of time, for a full treatment on this topic, Pastor Matthias has preached two sermons specifically on this, one in the book of Ephesians and one in the book of Colossians. So for him to really flesh out even more of the, the historical context and what the Bible has to say about that, I would refer you to those. But for our purposes today, it's not our natural idea of what slavery is. We know that God has created everyone with inherent value, dignity, and worth, and that informs how we view this text. So now what do we do with this text? Well, the text seems to be talking about, okay, you're in this relationship and if it's difficult, you're supposed to endure for this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But what if you do good and suffer, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So I think normally what we do when we get to this text is, okay, we don't have, or I, I None of us are in this household servant to master relationship, but 
We have employee-employer relationships. So I think we just draw a connection and go, you're supposed to honor your, the, your boss. You're supposed to, even if they're not nice to you, even if they didn't give you the promotion that you wanted, you're supposed to honor them. That's not untrue. And I don't think that's an unfair way to apply this text to our life. But I think that, I think it misses the, the, the foundation or the main thrust of the text that Peter is trying to get us to understand. What Peter is trying to get us to understand is that more important than our freedom or a perfectly just employee-employer relationship is the demonstration of following Christ and showing as a living example, having our lives be almost a sermon or a living example of what his life was and how we are obedient to him. Feel the weight of what Peter is saying in these verses. Imagine you are one of those servants in that first century and you're attending the church and the letter from the apostle Peter comes in and you get to this section and it says servants. And you're like, okay, he's going to tell me how I get out of this situation or how, how God is going to free me from this context. And he says, even if you have a master that is just or unjust, Stay, be faithful, submit. Because by doing that, you're going to emulate what Jesus Christ has done. Man, the, the weight of that would have been significant. And so for us, I think what, what we should take from it, our application point is just to understand what Christ has done for us and then the joy that we get to walk in that. This is a quote from Edmund Clowney that I think really sums up this point really well. It says, Peter here is applying the teaching he heard from his Lord. It is the privilege of those who are sons and daughters of the Most High to imitate the magnificent of their Father's mercy. They rise above simple justice to reflect God's goodness and love. Unthreatened by evil, they can overcome evil with good and in the midst of suffering show mercy to those who would show no mercy toward them. And this isn't, again, just an opportunity to reflect on what Jesus did for us, that he suffered unjustly, that he unjustly or did not need to take our sins upon him, the sins that we, we placed upon him, but yet then he shows us mercy. And in a small way, a reflective way, when we suffer unjustly or when these Christians suffered unjustly, what it said to the watching world of my allegiance is to Jesus. I want to walk as he did. And then it shows the outside world that our hope, our home is not here. We're exiles and our hope is in one to come. A lot of text today, lots of, lots of imperatives, things for us to think through, things to do. Um, but I want us to really, really just take home the main theme of now that we have been saved, now that we are these chosen people, how would God have us walk? What does it look like to be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation? How do we live honorable, honorably? How are we fighting the fleshly desires in our heart? What does Christian submission look like to governing authorities? And what by our submission are we communicating to the people around us and glorifying God? And then ultimately, I think my, my desire is for us to have a strong love for the brothers and sisters around us. The people that we may disagree with on interpretations of this and the direct application, but I ask that God would give us the desire and ability to, to obey him, to be slaves of Christ and ultimately glorify him in everything that we do. Let me go ahead and close us in prayer. Father, again, thank you for the opportunity to, to open your word this morning, to hear what you have revealed to us through this book of 1 Peter. I pray that you give us the ability to, to obey, to have a posture, a hard posture of one that wants to be like our Savior Jesus and walk as he did. All this in his name. Amen.